वेलकम टू दी ऑनलाइन क्लास ऑफ प्रोफेसर एस के पॉल एच ओ डी यूनिवर्सिटी डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ इंग्लिश बी आर ए बिहार यूनिवर्सिटी मुजफ्फरपुर गुड आफ्टरनून द डियर स्टूडेंट्स ऑफ पी एच डी कोर्स वर्क टूडे आई एम गोइंग टू डिलीवर माई लेक्चर ऑन पोस्ट कॉलोनियल नावल्स एंड नावलिस्ट सो पोस्ट कॉलोनियल इन डिफरेंट फॉर्म Uh, say uh, uh, both in context of western and indian literature so this is an this would be an exhaustive uh, um, lecture for you to discuss on post colonial elements uh, uh, in world literature uh, so a uh, disc a uh, uh, discussion of post colonial literature must be acknowledged uh, the scope and complexity of the term post colonial temporarily uh, the term uh, designates any national literature written after the nation gained independence uh, from a colonizing power according to this definition all literature written in the united states after 1776 uh, could qualify as uh, uh, post colonial uh, because the united states has occupied the position of an economic and political world power uh, since the 19th century however it is today regarded more as a historically colonizing force uh, than as a former colony of great britain uh, within this field of literary studies post colonial refers to those nations that gained independence between the last quarter of the 19th century and the 1960s geographically post colonial is a global term it designates nations of the caribbean central and south america africa the south pacific islands and malaysia it applies uh, equally to india ireland australia new zealand canada and the philippines the colonizing powers to which these countries we are subjected and with which they have continued to contend after uh, gaining um, independence are great britain a uh, great britain france uh, spain portugal uh, belgium germany and the united states post colonial studies are not limited by a uh, geography or uh, or time however they treat a broad span of concerns the functioning of different empires uh, during the colonial period and varying administrative systems left as legacies to the former colonies a uh, former colonies um, so Uh, they treat a broad span of concerns the functioning of different empires during the colonial period and varying administrative systems left as legacies to the former colonies the specific conditions under which independence was gained in each case cultural economic and linguistic imperialism uh, that persists after independence and the local concerns of education government citizenship and identity post colonial literature tends to address opposition to imperial forces as it seeks uh, uh, to define autonomous uh, national identity in that quest uh, post colonial literature explores issues of cultural alienation at and it struggles to express at uh, the specificity and parti- and and uh, <clears throat> particularities of indigenous cultures in languages uh, that are not generally the original languages of the indigenous peoples but rather the languages of the uh, former colonizers the kenyan writer uh, nagyugi uh, wa thiong over uh, decided in 1981 after his imprison imprisonment uh, and exile uh, for the co-authoring and producing uh, two uh, qqu uh, language plays that criticized the post colonial kenyan government to switch from english to uh, qq as the language for his writings similarly the irishman samuel beckett uh, chose to live in france 
and write in French because uh, his, uh, that this location and language did not carry the baggage of uh, Ireland's struggles for independence from Britain. For many post-colonial writers then to write uh, in the language of the colonizing power is an act of acceptance and acquiescence uh, uh, to that power even if that power is no longer physically present. <clears throat> Anita Desai The issue of language is complex. However, although writing in the language of the colonizers implies some complicity with their power and cultural dominance, there are questions of circulation and counter discourse to consider. Uh, can the circulation and readership of uh, uh, Nigyogi's uh, um, uh, writings be as wide in KQ and KQU as in English? Can the post colonial voice of uh, resistance against uh, a dominance and hegemony um, of the empire be heard in the Caribbean uh, patios uh, to express uh, post colonial? The struggles and establish a national identity in the languages of the colonizing powers English French or Spanish is to form a counter discourse that can be heard at the center of the empire to express oneself in a language that is not one's own a language that does not belong to one's land but has been violently imposed on it is a source of tension that gives rise not only to feelings of alienation and uncertainty regarding the legitimacy of the uh, mother tongue, but uh, also to confusion regarding identity. To what degree is a citizen? To a what degree is a citizen from India truly Indian? having been educated in English, writing in English, and even communicating with fellow Indians in the language of the British Empire. Although India possesses national identity, history, literature, and cultural practices, how can these remain purely Indian after 200 years of British rule? Just as post-colonial Indian literature uh, finds expression in English not in one of the hundreds of Indian languages, so does it strive to define and establish an identity that can no longer be pure. This post-independence, uh, post-colonial identity must admit that it is a hybrid, a mix, uh, of, uh, a mix of colonial and national identities transmitted through education, government, religion, and social practices. The dynamics of uh, a foregrounding and theorizing uh, uh, plurality of identities, mixing of cultures and independence between colonizers and colonized, as well as localized political concerns, uh, creates a reciprocity between post-colonial fiction and post-colonial theory. The, the interdependent development of post-colonial fiction and theory constitutes post-colonialism. The association with post-structuralism and post-modernism is not accidental. These schools of literary and cultural criticism serve to validate the margins of artistic production by uh, deconstructing centers of truth. These forms of criticism posit that truth, uh, meaning, and identity are never axiomatic. They are in a constant state of production, wholly dependent on the context in which they appear. Post-colonial theorists stress that colonial identity is created by uh, the ruling colonizing powers, for example, Edward Edward W. Said's seminal work, Orientalism, published in 1978, argues that the Orient is a set of images and assumptions constructed by the Western literary canon and projected onto colonized nations, along with Said, Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak, and Homi K. Bhava, argue that these uh, fabricated, projected images of, uh, of the Oriental other provide a framework and support uh, for the enlightened European subject. 
India's subaltern subaltern studies group led by uh, Ranjit uh, Ranjit Guha and SP Walk. Ran, uh, Ranjit Guha and SP Walk uh, rewrites the history of British occupation uh, for the purposes of asserting uh, versions uh, uh, versions of cultural identity free from imperial constructions. Just as the Oriental other was given form uh, through writing, <coughs> <coughs> so the post-colonial subject seeks expression through literature. With each post-colonial novel uh, that is written, a new version of post-colonial subjectivity is told and a new theory of cultural differences uh, as well as political and intellectual autonomy is formulated formulated. In post-colonialism, uh, fiction and theory uh, work together to define, shape and explain, uh, shape and stretch each other's boundaries. Among the principal themes of developed in post-colonial fiction are those of exile and alienation, rebellion, struggle and opposition against uh, colonial powers and mixing or confusion of identities, uh, multiculturalism and the establishment of cultural autonomy uh, free from imperial, imperial forces. Exile and alienation. Exile and alienation are represented uh, both physically and uh, figuratively uh, in post-colonial fiction. Exile occurs when the protagonist or another character is really a member of an indigenous people subjected to the colonial power travels to the land of colonizers for the purpose of education or finding work. Uh, becoming a marginal member of uh, society in the colonizing nation, the subject takes on certain characteristics uh, and values of the oppressing culture. Uh, thereafter, returning to the land of birth is nearly impossible because of the psychological changes uh, uh, the post-colonial subject has experienced uh, uh, while away. Physical exile also occurs for political reasons. The subject either acts out against the government and is sent away or chooses uh, to leave the homeland because colonial and post-colonial rules uh, have wreaked, wreaked uh, much change on the native environment that it becomes uh, unlivable. Figuratively, the theme of exile is expressed as alienation and represents uh, us a search for the self. Colonial conditions in the native land uh, render a native culture, language, and education inferior to the uh, culture and governing systems of the colonizers. Such cultural repression and validation of the imperial other provoke in the post-colonial protagonist an identity crisis and prompt him or to her to search for a legitimate and positive uh, ima image of the self. In order to embark on the quest uh, for the self, the protagonist must uh, first be split, shattered or called into question and uh, leading to alienation from society. Alienation is similar to exile uh, in that the subject is no longer at home either physically or psychologically in the native land. Physical alienation occurs when an otherwise uh, <coughs> respectable inhabitant of the uh, native land is considered criminal or subversive by colonial law, uh, leading to imprisonment or the uh, revocation of, of societal privileges for the subject. More often, alienation is represented as uh, psychological in post-colonial fiction. Um, it is the state of not belonging, of not having a true home. Post-colonial subjects are alienated by uh, Eurocentric uh, imperial systems that will never uh, fully accept them either culturally or racially. Uh, at the same time, they are alienated by native cultures uh, that have either, uh, either 
acquiesced to the colonial system uh, or uh, rejected them rejected them because uh, because they speak they speak the language of colonizers uh, or have received the education of the empire one of the most in-depth explorations of cultural exile and quest for the self is presented in James Joyce's Ulysses, uh, published in 1922, although its main characters Stephen Dedalus, uh, Leopold Bloom and Molly Bloom never leave Dublin, the novel draws a modern parallel uh, to Homer's Odyssey, published in uh, 725 BC. English translation in 1614. The epic story of a man's alienation from his home, exile to a strange lands and search for a way back home, metaphorically a search for the self. Uh, on the surface, Joyce's novel does not appear to be concerned with uh, Ireland's struggle for freedom from centuries uh, of British rule. The action of the novel takes place in one day. The plot consists in Bloom and Stephen uh, going about their day and Bloom making his way home. Yet, the novel operates on uh, many levels, uh, literally, uh, metaphorically and mythically, uh, one of which emerges uh, from its many references to the British occupation uh, of Ireland and the Irish struggle for political autonomy. Following uh, Bloom in his journey through Dublin, the novel depicts his departure from home and his return to home at the end as an exploration of Irish subjectivity. What the reader discovers as the many layers of meaning unravel is that Bloom is neither a pure Irishman nor a pure product of British colonial rule. The novel makes references to Bloom's Jewish descent. His wife Molly grew up in Gibraltar, the geographically gateway for British imperial expansion. And now Bloom's English is a multicultural mix of Irish Irishisms and Italian and Greek words. This modern odyssey with colonial concerns shows that a search for the self leads to the revelation of an identity, an identity that is not culturally pure. The novel also shows that as soon as one leaves a home, uh, all notions, all notions of a pure, uh, unified self are lost. A prototypical novel of exile and alienation is uh, George Lamming's In the Castle of My Skin, published in 1953. This autobiographical uh, Bildung's uh, Roman uh, presents the author's presents the author's childhood in Barbados uh, from his point of view at the age of 23 uh, while living in London. He is led, he is led into uh, retrospection by the alienation he experiences in the capital of the colo colonizers, the childhood that uh, he revisits and that forms the narrative uh, chronologically parallels the last stages of colonialism in the Caribbean and unfolds against the backdrop of, uh, of rising nationalism. The author's childhood of development meaningfully parallels the loss of cultural innocence as destructive floods, a general strike across the island and riots mark his ninth year and and the land of the village is sold to business at a business just before he takes his first job in neighboring Trinidad. As the protagonist leaves Barbados, his village falls apart, thus producing an analog analogy uh, between loss of childhood. Why? Uh, hello? 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 But somebody told me that I wasn't. I, I don't know what is happening. Am I audible? 
am i audible have i been audible all through okay as the protagonist leaves a barbados his village falls apart uh, thus uh, producing an analogy between loss of childhood uh, innocence and disruption of cultural identity between exile and alienation and the destruction of native lands by colonization only from the point of view physical and spiritual alienation um, uh, can the narrator look back and understand the destruction of his homeland only from this state of exile can be can can he narrate his story the only home to which he can return is the is the one that is rendered uh, fictional the one that constitutes uh, his story as the title suggests in the in suggests uh, in the state of exile that colonialism has forced upon him the narrator is left with only his body uh, which he which has become his home the theme what is that you are not listening to me what is that hello 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 am i am i audible but uh, rajiv ranjan says that i am not okay 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 please 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 cope with us please don't interrupt whatever be the network quality just let me finish because audio, some audio and video um, recordings are already going on so you will not be at loss i will send them the theme of alienation and exclusion of people not only from a dominant cultural a dominant cultural but also from their own 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 language own land language and cultural uh, practices has extended the boundaries of post colonial literature to include feminist concerns regarding the oppression of women by men anita desai's novel fire on the mountain uh, published in 1976 77 uh, addresses the cultural and social alienation uh, of women in india with an unusual twist on the theme of exile the novel's protagonist uh, nanda kaul has retired uh, to a mountain mountain top in the punjab after fulfilling, fulfilling the duties of wife and mother this exile uh, into retirement in her old age uh, foreshadows the transformative exile that awaits uh, nanda the novel first depicts uh, her as the image of indian womanly perfection a stately uh, gentle uh, upstanding and refined in her manners nanda paints her life uh, as a young woman in the colors of happiness her childhood what her parents offered uh, her as a child in a society that typically uh, holds girls in contempt uh, and her marriage uh, by the end of the narrative she reveals the unhappy reality of her past her father was easily uh, absent when she was a child and he never brought home nice gifts her husband never loved or respected her and he kept a mistress throughout his marriage uh, to nanda and she never enjoyed a close days uh, with her children who were in that in in fact uh, responsible for placing her atop uh, a mountain in order to be rid of her so that nanda's story does not appear uh, to be tragic or out of the ordinary ordinary for women in india uh, india the novel presents a minor character uh, ila das whose life story is indeed tragic and uh, unlucky ila is a childhood friend of nanda who has not grown up she is vulgar ill mannered and rather stupid ila has also been unlucky her father died when she was young her mother was and uh, mother was an invalid her mother was and 
uh, her mother was an invalid and her brothers uh, squandered the family fortune. Nanda and her husband uh, rescued Ila many times uh, uh, from, their, uh, from their poverty by, pr by procuring jobs uh, uh, for her that she, she fails to keep. She is well-intentioned but uh, has no uh, social, uh, social graces to uh, compensate uh, for her lack of uh, survival skills. One day, just after having tea with Nanda, Hila is Uh, um, so dear, so one day just after having tea with Nanda, Ila is raped and killed in the streets. Uh, streets. Uh, this event marks uh, a turning point for Nanda, who admits to the social alienation she has experienced her whole life. She then performs the exit, exit ritual and becomes one with uh, the fire god Agni. The bearer of the flame of uh, eternal life by walking into hot coals. Her act of exile from the physical realm represents her alienation and at the same time same time raises her life to a higher symbolic uh, uh, transformative level. A struggle and uh, Struggle and opposition. Hello. Hello. Ha ha. Ham thori dekhe baad phone kar rahe hain. online class le rahe hain. Please. Ham thori dekhe baad ab. Okay, I'll call you later. Hello. Am I audible? Hello. Hello. Hello? 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 Hello. Hello. Aside from the themes of alienation, exile, a confusion of identity, aside from the themes of aside from the themes of alienation, exile, a confusion of identity, and search for the self. Post-colonial fiction is also characterized by tensions uh, uh, between colonizer and colonized, or between the old colonial society, uh, uh, between the uh, between the old colonial society and the emerging post-colonial one. These multiple themes uh, the These multiple themes uh, that seek to define the post-colonial conditions are often present in an overlap within the same novel, but it is just as often the case that one theme stands. One theme stands. When the theme of social and political tensions when the theme of social and political uh, when the theme of social and political tension upstages the others it can take the form of direct confrontation between colonizer and colonized for example in em forster's novel a passage to india published in 1924, colonial tensions make their way to the courtroom uh, when the respectable Indian citizen, Dr. Aziz, is accused of attacking, 
is, um, is accused of attacking a visiting English woman, Adela Queste, uh, during a friendly outing to some uh, uh, regionally uh, famous caves. Everyone in town uh, takes a side as the polemics surrounding the trial against Aziz uh, reach an explosive level. The Indians believe uh, strongly in, in Aziz's uh, innocence, uh, while the occupying British remain uh, convinced that Aziz is a local savage incapable of restraining himself around a white uh, woman. The trial marks the climax of the novel, and the turning point occurs when Adela takes uh, the witness stand only to waver in her testimony and withdraw her charges against Aziz. Here colonial tensions are played out on a symbolically legal level. The confrontation between colonized and colonizer is expressed, is expressed as a life or death issue of uh, a guilt or innocence to be decided by emotional fervor and uh, resentment of the colonial situation only thinly veiled by justice in the end. Justice prevails in that Adela recants her accusation, uh, but the readiness of the British to bring Aziz to trial and Indians, uh, and the Indians uh, protest against, uh, against uh, such an act of uh, oppressive power reveal the uh, prejudices and exemplify, exemplify the hatred and mistrust that colonialism promotes on each of the opposing sides. The novel in, in, encapsulates uh, uh, colonial hatred and mistrust uh, in a legal issue, the trial, yet it is a legal issue. Our country's government forcibly taking over another country's rights to uh, govern itself that provides uh, the novel uh, encapsulates a colonial hatred and uh, mistrust, uh, mistrust in a legal issue, the trial, yet it is a legal issue. One country's government forcibly taking over another country's rights to govern itself uh, that provokes this hatred and mistrust. Chinua HEB. In the novel Things Fall Apart, published in 1958 by the Nigerian author Chinua HEB, a struggle, confrontation, and rebellion are evident from start to finish. The protagonist uh, uh, Okonko is a leader of an, uh, of an Igbo village and has built uh, a reputation from his youth as a great wrestler. He develops, he develops fears a warrior like you ways in opposition uh, to his father who died a man of weak a woman like character uh, okonkwo is a strict ruler adhering closely to the traditions of his religion and culture he does not de uh, defy tradition when community uh, elders command the execution the execution uh, of his adopted son he obediently accepts the traditional punishment of seven years of exile when he inadvertently kills a, a clans, clans man. Okonkwo is a warrior whose uh, principal cause is to preserve his culture even if it means uh, rebelling against uh, his father and at times cruelly uh, beating his wives. Uh, ironically, in obeying the dictates of tradition by serving the sentence of exile, Okonkwo allows, allows his uh, culture to be destroyed. Uh, during the seven years of his absence, British missionaries uh, move in and, 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 and proselytize. In exile, Okunpo uh, learns from a friend that uh, when people in a, a neighboring village kill a missionary, a more white men came and annihilated the village's entire population. Okunpo returns to his community to find that a distinct commissioner, a uh, representative of the British government, has established a, a council. The climax of the novel stems from a conflict of religious interests. Uh, when the villagers burn down the missionaries, a ch missionaries' church because of uh, sacrilege uh, committed against their religion uh, by a convert, the commissioner perfor uh, performs an act of retribution uh, by imprisoning a group of Igbo men. 
including Okonkwo, uh, until uh, a fine is uh, collectively paid. In the final confrontation between colonized and colonizer, Okonkwo kills a British messenger uh, knowing immediately after the fact that the reckless act of violence has ruined his possibility of successfully combating the British with warrior-like integrity. When the district commissioner arrives at Okonkwo's uh, home to arrest him for the murder, he finds the warrior hanging from a tree, uh, uh, having committed suicide. Uh, the novel ends uh, with the commissioner's uh, uh, musings about, about how, a, how to integrate Okonkwo's story as uh, either a chapter or a paragraph in his book, the, the Pacification of the Primitive Tribes of the Lower Niger. Ajibe's novel depicts a struggle and conflict within the Igbo community uh, before Igbo community. Uh, Igbo people of this community uh, prior to colonization, but they could be reckoned with and resolved with colonization uh, came to uh, came the destruction of Igbo religion and conflicts uh, soon uh, uh, led not to re uh, resolution but to violence and death. The last words of the novel, the title of the district uh, district commissioner's book uh, book uh, reflect the British appro appropriation of African history. The chronicle of an Igbo village and the life of its leader becomes by the end of the novel, a mere episode in the history of British colonization. Multiculturalism and Identity Colonial rule, the control and assimilation of other nations, their cultures and histories was not executed without conflict, struggle and opposition. Uh, furthermore, it has left its uh, subjects, uh, colonized peoples, in a state of alienation and either physical or psychological exile from places that were once unquestionably their homes, while colonialism has created two distinct categories of people, a colonized and colonizer, each on the opposite side of the power divide. Of the power divide. Historically, it has also caused a blending of races, uh, languages, cultures, and systems of uh, uh, beliefs and values. This mixing of cultures is another principal theme in the post-colonial fiction, and it is often developed in the broader context of establishing identity. With that identity are the people of a colonized nation uh, left after centuries of foreign uh, occupation and rule uh, during which their neighbors were exported for labor or they themselves left home in search of legitim legitimating education and experience in Europe. On what cultural identity can an Indian family, for example, depend when the parents speak Hindi yet their children speak only English? What historical legitimacy can a community enjoy when its history has been rewritten by colonizers and when its laws have been overruled by the laws of the foreign land? The need for an identity not imposed by occupying forces uh, comes from a lack of created uh, by the violent uh, uh, intrusion and disruption of home by foreigners, foreign powers. In V.S. Nepal's A House for Mr. Vishwas, published in 1961, the house that the Hindu resident of Trinidad, Mr. Vishwas, insists on buying but cannot afford becomes a symbol of independence and, and identity. His is an unlucky life, a fraught with, uh, with poverty, lack of love and failure. Uh, analogues to oppressive colonizing powers is the, is the Tulsi uh, clan to whom Vishwas's wife remains faithful and who hold him in a contempt. Having had enough of homelessness and rambling, Vishwas buys the house no better than a shack 
and it stands for his pride, a fortress of autonomy, a towering above the prejudices and cultural oppression from which he suffers. His house also symbolizes the poverty and weakness uh, that members of minority groups Uh, that members of, of minority groups uh, experience in establishing cultural autonomy. The house of Mr. Vishwas is a metaphor uh, for his identity. It is at once a poor and ramshackle, yet it belongs uh, solely to him. In 2001, Nepal was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature uh, for his works and compelled us to see the presence of uh, suppressed histories. Salman Rushdie. Salman Rushdie's The Satanic Verses, published in 1988, deals in more complex terms with the issue of uh, establishing cultural identity in post-colonial Britain and India. Regarding the formation of the post-colonial subject, uh, this novel underscores ambivalence and posits the, that identity is composed through hybridity. Neither the British subject nor the Indian subject is uh, constituted in a culturally pure, pure fashion. The identities of both consist in effects and qualities of the other. Post-colonial identity is split between the cultural identity um, produced in the land of the colonizers and that of the colonized land between British history and Indian history, between formation under British rule uh, with its uh, uh, concomitant uh, values and customs and the values and customs of the indigenous culture uh, from the moment the two cultures meet and clash as part of the colonizing project, neither culture can remain pure or unaffected. The satanic verses expresses uh, this process in terms of good and evil. Rushdie blurs the distinction between the colonizers as evil and the colonized as good by transforming the characteristics of the of the two protagonists. Gibril uh, Farishta Gibril Farishta and Saladin uh, uh, Chamcha Gibriel was a poor orphan who became a movie star in Bombay, Mumbai. He achieved stardom by acting the parts of, of Hindu gods in, the, in theological films and all the women of Bombay desired desire him. Aside from the divine roles he plays and the, uh, the, the, Arch and the Archangel, Archangel and the archangel his name denotes uh, he developed the physical attributes of an angel. After the start of the novel, he quickly acquires a halo and the power to entrance uh, whomever he meets in terms of post-colonial subjectivity. Gabriel. Gabriel initially represents the purity of Indian culture and identity. But the end of the novel, he has become disturbed and, uh, and delusional, transforming into Ezreal, the angel of death. Gabriel parades around London blowing Ezreal's trumpet, uh, provoking fires and pronouncing destruction. Uh, thematically, Gabriel is in London to colonize the land of colonizer. As, Arch uh, as Archangel, he fancies himself the harbinger of change for humanity and he declares to the city of London that he intends to uh, tropicalize it. Uh, in transforming from a benevolent angel into the angel of death and destruction, <coughs> Gabriel represents the uh, absolu absolutist absolutist system of values imposed on India by the British uh, Gabriel, the post-colonial subject is both good and evil. He is both the culturally pure colonial uh, native and a violent invading force. 
his insanity and subsequent death suggest that such absolute uh, inflexibility, uh, inflexi uh, inflexible identities lead to totalitarianism um, and destruction in order to thrive. The post-colonial subject must be constituted by a working blend of cultural attributes. By contrast, a Saladin Chamcha is a brown Englishman, an Indian, an India, an Indian made in Britain, a Bombay born. He was sent to uh, sent to English schools as a boy, and there he remained. He has made a career of uh, uh, providing the voices uh, for inanimate objects in British television commercials as well as for the. <coughs> animated cartoon character uh, Maxim Alien. Saladin uh, proves to have the most uh, malleable of uh, British um, accents with which he can uh, pass for a, a cat's up bottle, a proud Englishman or an alien at will. He has expelled the Indian from uh, himself a lifestyle, a face and voice, and represents the post-colonial Indian subject who has completely subscribed to British ways. It is not surprising that shortly after, that shortly after the start of the novel, Saladin begins to grow horns. As the Indian who has betrayed his culture and national identity, Saladin is a product of post-colonial evil. He metamorphoses into a full-blown uh, eight-foot uh, goat-like devil, just a Gabriel, just a Gabriel um, under undergoes uh, undergoes a qualitative transformation from good to bad angel. So. Saladin rehumanizes himself upon admitting his hatred for a Mr. Perfecto. Gibril, who betrayed Saladin at the time of the latter's unjustified arrest, in the end it is Saladin who makes of himself a successful post-colonial subject. Having received a British education and understanding the position of fellow immigrants in London, he returns to his native Bombay to his dying father's side and there he decides to stay. <coughs> stay. <coughs> the start of the novel presents the situation that brings the Saladin and Gibril together. They take the same plane to London from India and the plane is hijacked by Sikh militant separatists. They spent more than 100 days hovering over the British Isles until the plane explodes. Saladin and Gibril are the sole survivors. As they descend toward English soil, the two protagonists are transmuted into a devil and angel, uh, first passing through a state of uh, being one. The process of uh, uniting Saladin and Gabriel in order to separate them uh, as devil and angel represents the cultural and uh, symbolic uh, splitting of the post-colonial subject. The novel then uh, renders ambiguous their respective identities as Gibril uh, becomes a demonic uh, angel and Saladin develops his sense of humanity uh, through his experience as a devil. Above all, the novel posits that post-colonial identity is not a stable, uh, absolute or fixed. It is always in a process of, uh, of uh, renegotiating uh, renegotiating uh, itself. The post-colonial subject is neither a culturally poor, uh, pure colonized uh, native nor a completely converted object of colonizing discipline and control. <coughs> post-colonial identity is necessarily a dynamic blend of the qualities, uh, mentalities and cultural formations of both, uh, both colonized and colonizer. Post-colonial fiction is not 
limited to the themes of exile and alienation, a struggle and opposition, and cultural hybridity. Uh, many post-colonial novelists have developed other themes, other themes such as such as American and European enslavement of Africans, the historical oppression of uh, uh, black people uh, in the United States, and the forced assimilation in North America of minority cultures such as Native Americans, Latinos, and Asian immigrants. Uh, some have addressed the lives, lives of North Africans and their descendants in France and of Turkish immigrants in Germany. Regardless of the topic or setting, however, the post-colonial novel concerns itself with the cultural and political situation uh, created uh, by the colonial uh, project, the necessarily violent and oppressive encounter between colonizer and colonized. Decolonization, which sets out to change the order of the world, is clearly an agenda for total discover, but it cannot be accomplished by the wave of a magic wand, a natural cataclysm, or a gentleman's agreement. Decolonization, uh, we know, is, uh, an, is, is a historical process. In other words, it can only be understood, it can only find its significance and become self-coherent insofar as we can discern the history making movement which gives it form uh, which gives it form and substance decolonization is the encounter between uh, two congenitally uh, antagonistic forces that in fact uh, owe their singularity uh, singul singularity uh, to the kind of uh, uh, to the kind of uh, uh, reification re uh, uh, secreted and nurtured and nurtured uh, by the colonial uh, situation. The first confrontation was colored by uh, violence and their cohabitation, or rather, the exploitation of the colonized by the colonizer continued. <clears throat> at the point of the uh, bayonet and, and under a uh, cannon fire. The colonists and the colonized are old acquaintances and consequently the colonist is right when he says he knows them. It is the, <coughs> it is the colonist who fabricated and continues to fabricate the, the, the colonized subject the colonist uh, uh, devices his validity, that is, his wealth uh, from the colonial system. The wretched of the earth, Fanon. Fanon is the pioneer of post-colonial studies in the world. He is the first thinker to begin to realize the dire consequences of colonialism and again he is the first writer to register his strong opposition to various forms of colonialism to overcome the trauma of colonialism and to challenge it he thought the process of decolonization had to be uh, had to be initiated if the literature written during the heyday of uh, imperialism to support the empire is called colonial literature, then literature written after the empire ceased to exist to challenge the dominance of the empire on the so-called colonized nations is called post-colonial literature. Post-colonialism is an umbrella term which is inclusive of all discourses that challenge the a dominance of all kinds of hegemony in all walks of human life. Post-colonial scholars have pointed out that when two cultures sharing uh, unequal power confront each other, the weaker culture, uh, the weaker culture seeks different alternatives to meet the situation. If imitation and internalization of the values of the dominant culture is uh, one of the responses to struggle to retain its uh, identity by turning to its roots, uh, roots is another. For instance, the seeds of British imperialism can be seen in Shakespeare and Marlowe, who happen to be the 
two most significant British uh, Renaissance writers. It is, Queen El it is Queen Elizabeth who gave the royal consent to the British Navy to sail across the European oceans and reach the far off places uh, for the purpose of trade and commerce, uh, which eventually led to the establishment of the of the British colonies, creating a new chapter in the history of uh, the history of British Raj. Prospero, in Shakespeare's Tempest, for his own political reasons, uh, comes to an island uh, for shelter for him as well as for his only daughter. He, in the course of time, acquires control over the original inhabitants of the island, uh, considers them as savages, uh, uh, uncivilized uh, brutes who need to be uh, taught lessons. Better one he, in the course of time, acquires control over the original inhabitants of the island, considers them as savages, uncivilized brutes, uh, who need to be taught uh, lessons in life and treats them as uh, inferior, forgetting the fact that he himself uh, is an outsider and has come here to get shelter. He hates uh, the culture, language and manners of the inhabitants living on their island and thinks that he has come here uh, to redeem them from uh, from what he considers to be an uncivilized uh, way of life. We hardly see any differences between uh, what uh, uh, Prospero did on the island and what the British did when they annexed a large part of India. Similarly, we find no big difference between uh, what the former British imperialism did in their colonies and what the American uh, uh, American uh, new imperialism is doing now in some parts of the uh, globe today. One of the most exciting features of English literature today is the, exp is the explosion of the post-colonial literatures, literatures written in English in former colonized societies. This has given rise to a range of theoretical ideas, concepts, problems and debates and these have been addressed to uh, addressed in a range of articles essays talks and books uh, here here uh, i have tried to um, i have tried to make uh, on to look at the post colonial studies in indian literature it was a period which witnessed uh, many changes in indian society so, the, this is the end of the part one of my lecture. Part one of, part one of this lecture is now over and the lecture will be finished uh, in, the, in part two series. Thank you. Thank you. My lecture is over for today. Thank you. Thank you.